Okay, today is our last day of our Daniel uh, seminar that we've been doing since January 29th. So it's been exactly, is today the 29th? <laughs> it's been exactly a month. And um, so this morning we're going to talk about uh, deliverance in the book of Daniel. And then uh, not just focused in Daniel, we'll read literally just a few verses in Daniel. Then we're going to veer off and talk about the second coming and a little bit about the rapture and how the world understands the rapture and, uh, and how that coincides with what the Bible says. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And then this afternoon is our last installment of the series, and it's called Holy Living. And that starts at 2 o'clock, so we invite you to stay uh, for 2 o'clock uh, for this last, very, very last one. What we had to do for this whole series, what I've had to do is I've been using these... Uh, pre-made lessons, uh, you know, a, a seminar in the box, so to speak. And there's actually 32 lessons, if I'm not mistaken, in the whole set. Um, I've only gone over 20 of them. So there's a lot of things that I just, uh, not that they're not important, but there's a lot of things I just had to skip over. Um, and even some of the things in Daniel had to skip over. So I may, if there's time, I may uh, talk a little bit about Daniel 12, and those verses that talk about the 1260 days, the 1290 days, and the 1335 days. So I may allude to that a little bit, or maybe this afternoon when there's, when there's, when there's more time. So uh, come this afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to talk about holy living, which is a very good way to end the series, because Daniel chapter 1 starts with a description of the guys involved in the narratives, Daniel and his three friends, and how they lived their lives in those circumstances, in those very trying and unfamiliar surroundings, those kinds of circumstances. Um, they, they were God's heroes. They remained faithful to God when the temptations were very strong to compromise their faith and go along with the flow in this, in this strange country. And so we're going to conclude this whole series by talking about how we should be living our lives today. You will be challenged as is the nature of the Bible. The Bible challenges us. Um, too often we pick and choose what we want to practice in the Bible. You may believe in the whole Bible, and think it's all inspired. That's not the issue. The issue is whether we're practicing this part or that part in a very holistic and complete sense. That's where we fall short often. So we're going to talk about holy living this afternoon at 2 o'clock. So I really invite you to be here for that, uh, that last one. Um, we've been using these uh, lessons, um, which uh, I'm, I'm writing my own lessons. They may be finished in this lifetime, <laughs> or they may be finished when I go to heaven, but then in heaven there will be no reason to write anything. So pray to the Lord that I'll live to be 100 years old, okay? My wife and I were just, you know, bemoaning the fact that in this life we don't have enough time, do we? There's just not enough time in this life to really do the things that you want to do, which is which should lead us to consider we better be using our time wisely. And don't you think God understands this? Um, you know, Adam lived to 930 years old. Man, if I could live that long. And then I'm sure when, when Adam was getting older and he was decaying physically and <clears throat> mentally and, you know, and he finally died... I bet he thought the same thing. Man, I hardly did anything. <laughs> I wish there was more time to live. And when we're busy with our ambitions and doing good things, it's just the nature that we wish we had more time. Well, through eternity, we're going to have all the time we need. Amen? We're going to have all the time we need. And uh, I think my point is God understands our lifetime now is on the average of what? 80 years old or something? That's the average. Nothing compared to almost a millennium. So God understands. 
He understands our time is way shorter to live. And so God works with us. Aren't you glad he's patient and merciful with us? Oh boy, I am. All right, let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Um, That scripture reading for this morning, thank you, Rosa, but uh, I chose the wrong scripture reading. I I forgot to update it. (laughs) It's not your fault. I forgot to update that scripture reading to a verse in Daniel chapter 12. So I want you to open your Bibles there. Um, The book of Daniel begins with a defeat for the people of God, and it ends in chapter 12 with a deliverance for his people. Amen? Amen? That's the way the book ends. And this great day of deliverance will be marked by the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. So this lesson that we're going to go over this morning is going to unlock that truth, the appearance of Christ, how he will come back and ultimately deliver his people. Now Christ delivers us in the murk and muddy waters of this imperfect life. Wouldn't you agree with that? Jesus walks with us and has ongoing deliverances for us as we battle against self and and we just try and live our best in this world of faithful life. He does deliver us. There's our stories. Your story is full of victories and deliverances, isn't it? Amen. It's full of it. But the ultimate deliverance, the big one, is when Christ comes back. How many of you say amen? Amen. That's the ultimate one. So that's where we're going to focus on this morning, not the smaller daily victories, and then they're not less small, but uh, the one that he gives you. All right, so Daniel chapter 12, and go to the very first verse of Daniel 12, and this is what the Bible says, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, who has charge of his people? Michael, the great prince, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Doesn't that sound scary? Oh, man, this time of trouble. It says, but at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Amen. There's only one book that guarantees life if your name is written in there. In the New Testament, it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. So there's, there's a lot of books in the, uh, described in the Old Testament. Book of Remembrance, Book of Tears, etc. But this book, if your name is found written in this book, that means you're guaranteed life. Amen? Um, if you purchase a plane ticket and they send you the confirmation or reservation number via email, you're guaranteed what? You're guaranteed that trip, that seat. So it's the same concept. This is guaranteed if your name is in that book. And so there will be a deliverance. And Michael, the great prince, is one that stands up. Now, the question has been asked in the past, well, who is this Michael? Michael means um, who is like God in Hebrew. Who is like the El part, the E-L part, always stands for God. So Daniel, Daniel, Daniel in Hebrew is God is my judge. Elohim is God. So the word Daniel means God is my judge. Okay? Um, Michael means who is like God. Who is like God. So that's a very, very interesting name. There's different viewpoints on Michael, on Michael. Um, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. Many have understood Michael to be a reference to Christ because Christ is the great prince that stands for God's people. And Michael is also called the archangel in Jude chapter, I mean, excuse me, Jude verse 9. Jesus has said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Jesus has said to return to earth with the voice of the archangel, Michael the archangel. Um, So it seemed logical that Michael is a possible reference to Christ, but there's people that view otherwise. The important thing I would say to remember is that Christ is not a created being. According to Scripture and the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church, our beliefs is that Christ is not a created being. So if some believe that Michael is a great archangel and angels or 
the archangel is created by God, that's where we would say it goes a little bit too far. Jesus is not a created being. He is eternally God, the exact representation of his being, etc. So we're not going to go delve uh, too deeply into that. Um, but what happens when Michael attempts to deliver God's people? In other words, when he's delivering his people, what are his people going through according to this verse? Verse 1. They're going through trouble. They're going through a great time of trouble. Now, this is interesting in this verse because it says that the people shall be delivered. However, it doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, I suppose to, to just be logical about this text, some may read that text and say, yes, God's people, there will be a time of trouble, but God's people will be delivered from that trouble in the sense that they won't go through it. Others may read it and say, well, God's people will be delivered by Michael, but they'll be delivered not from the trouble, but in the trouble. So some people have read that both ways. I would propose this morning that the definition of that Take it from the book of Daniel itself. Take it from Daniel itself. Because if you read the first six chapters of Daniel, namely Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 3, and Daniel chapter 6, namely those chapters, did Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were they delivered from trouble in the sense that they did not go through it, or were they delivered while they were going through the trouble, did God save them? Which one is it in those chapters? They were delivered. They went through the trouble. In Daniel chapter 1, God didn't deliver Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from being roped or chained and having to trek hundreds of miles to Babylon. And the thirst and... Although I don't think they were treated bad because they were the cream of the crop. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar was looking for. But yet they were still slaves. Even though they went to the palace to be educated in the University of Babylon. They lost their country. They were exiled from their country. Forcibly. And so God didn't save them from that. God didn't save them from witnessing atrocities and terrible disasters and killing of people when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem. Neither did Daniel rescue Daniel from the lion's den. He went in the lion's den. Right? He went through that trouble. The same with his three buddies. They were walking towards the fiery furnace and bound. And the Bible says that these three guys, they really did not know if God would save them or not. They knew God could save them, but they didn't know if God would save them. And don't you feel that way sometimes? We know intellectually, we know in our minds, in, in our belief system, we know because it's printed in black that God will save us. But even the best of people cannot say, we know God will save us for sure because of what they said in Daniel 3.16. But even if he does not, we still won't worship your image. So they went through that trouble, and as they got closer, they felt the heat hotter and hotter and hotter, and they were sweating, and they weren't sure still at that point until, of course, you know the rest of the story. So God does not rescue his people from all the troubles of life that are not caused by us. Sometimes we cause our own troubles. Amen? Sometimes we just do it to ourselves. That's why I've said sin is an acronym for self-inflicted nonsense. <laughs> Sometimes we do that to ourselves. But he deliver us, delivers us from trouble. And then those who are alive, let's look at verse 2. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 it says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall what? Awake. Awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I would think that Jesus is thinking of this particular passage in John chapter 5 
where Jesus basically says the same thing. Some are going to be resurrected to life and others to condemnation. So, while those who are alive at this time are delivered, what happens to those who are dead, according to this verse? They are awakened. And this is why the Old Testament and even the New Testament describes death as a sleep because you would readily recognize if you're using the term sleep, everybody awakes from sleep, normal, natural sleep. And that's what death is pictured like as a sleep because those who are in God's heart and vice versa, they'll awake to a resurrection. So let's look at the second coming of Christ. That's a good transition verse to look into the second coming of Christ. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, it's where all those T's are in the New Testament. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, right before Hebrews. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And look at verses 16 and 17. This is what the Bible says. Rejoice always. Oops, that's a wrong one. Chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command or with a loud shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise second. Oh, I'm sorry, first. I'm just testing you. Then we who are alive, who are, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay? So, in fact, if you look at chapter 4 and verse 9, the same chapter, verse 9, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for any to write to you. Um, and then he goes into those who had died. Apparently, the Corinthians were concerned about their loved ones who had died because they were expecting Jesus to come in their day. So what's going to happen with those? And that's why Paul is explaining this. All right, so um, the event that ultimately delivers God's people and resurrects the righteous is what event? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, he promised that he would come back. Go to John chapter 14. Go to John 14. And we'll read what uh, John 14 has to say. And the first few verses, <clears throat> Jesus, uh, this is where he's in that second floor apartment with his disciples on Passover Eve, and he's saying a lot of things. In fact, John records the most of what Jesus said to his disciples on that night. And Jesus says, verse 1, John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. So this is a good passage for those with heart trouble, amen? Amen. It's a good passage. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So Jesus promises this. He will come back to take us where he is. Currently, he is in heaven. So the promise to the disciples is that Jesus says, I will come what? Again. I will come again. Amen? Amen. We've got to hold on to this promise. It's as real as the hand in front of your face. Jesus is coming again. Amen. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 describes in some more detail how that coming is going to take about. Some of the uh, visuals and audibles that accompany the second coming of Christ. Matthew chapter 25 and 24 and 25, he talks, there's a little bit more detail, etc. But this is the promise that he will come again. And then according to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, remember the disciples are, are with Jesus, and Jesus is giving them last minute instructions. And of course, as, as naturally as, as, as can be, the disciples, they, uh, according to what their question is to Jesus, they still don't 
they still haven't disassociated themselves with the popular political, religious sentiment of the Messiah and how his kingdom will take place on earth. So their, their paradigm, their mindset has not quite been 100% altered by Jesus' teachings. And that's evidence in the fact that they asked Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still talking in literal, nationalistic, political terms. And Jesus responds and he says, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has set. They're still thinking of those literal terms. It's interesting how Jesus doesn't even answer that question and he redirects their thoughts from national Israel on an earthly realm setting up their kingdom, which would mean obviously that their occupiers, the Romans, because they occupied Palestine, they'd have to be ousted, obviously. Jesus doesn't even go there. He says something far more important. And he says in verses 9 through 11, he says, you will be my witnesses when blank comes upon you. The Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses. You'll go to Jerusalem. And then from there through all of Judea, which was the southern part of the Palestinian land. And then to Samaria, which was up north, which was the old capital of Israel. And then to all the parts of the world. In fact, if you really think about it, that one verse is a virtual summary of the entire book of Acts. It's a summary of the entire book. Because that's exactly what happened from the day of Pentecost onwards. It's exactly what happened. And so what is happening here is that this... Now, so Jesus is with them and He ascends. They're staring up into the sky. You know, ooh, wow. How did, what happened? And then there's two angels, two men dressed in white apparel. And what did they tell the disciples? They said, this same Jesus will come back in like manner as you see him go up in like manner. Well, how did Jesus go up? In a cloud. And he went up with his physical body. Same beard, same height. Same tone of voice, same creases under his eyes and on his face, same big strong hands that grip like steel because he was a carpenter, same guy. Scars on his forehead, those thorns that were embedded, the scars there, scars on his, you know, on his wrists and on his feet and on his side, same Jesus. It was a glorified body, yes, but the same guy. We'll come back in like manner. The same Jesus in the clouds of heaven. That's what these angels are telling Christ, or excuse me, telling the disciples. So his ascent was visible. It was personal. His descent will be visible and personal. Amen? It's the same thing. And how many people on earth will see Christ at the second coming? How many people? There's a verse in Matthew 20. For verse 30, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, who does that include all? Everybody. Everyone. It includes the saved and the unsaved. When Jesus comes back, and if you have had faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, before the Savior had come to planet earth in Old Testament times, those who had had faith in the coming Messiah, they're in the same group as you and I are. Pre-cross and post-cross, we all have the same faith in the Messiah, right? But when it says all tribes, all people, and the tribes shall mourn, who's doing the mourning? The saved or the unsaved? It's got to be the unsaved. We're not mourning when Christ comes back. Quite the opposite, right? Right? Hallelujah, here's our God. He has come to save us. So all people will see him. The second coming of Christ will be a world encircling event. In fact, turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. I know many of you know, uh, know this, are familiar with this verse already. Uh, some of you are 
who are curious what this verse actually says. Romans chapter, um, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. And this is what the Bible says. Behold, he is coming with the what? The clouds. Same thing that Matthew 24 and 25 say. Same thing in Thessalonians. Uh, same thing in Acts chapter 1. Same thing here in Revelation. He is coming with the clouds and what does it say? Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. So this imagery is also found in Daniel chapter 7 and of course in Matthew 24, 30. The clouds of heaven. Everybody will see him. So this is what's going on. What are Christians to do when somebody tells them that Christ has come secretly? What are Christians to do? Don't go. Don't believe it. And don't go. Um, Jesus is talking about this in Matthew 24. If you see, if somebody tells you, look, he is out in the desert. In other words, in the uh, rural areas. Jesus says, don't believe it. If he's in a room or if he's here, maybe in the urban areas, Jesus says, don't go out. And then he says, because as a lightning shines from the east and the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what he is saying is, if somebody's telling you, there he is over there, impossible. Because of the verses that we just read. It will be very visible, it will be very audible, and everyone will see him. Now, I don't know how that works out on a round globe. If the globe was flat, that would be easier, wouldn't it? It would make sense. It would be easier. Every eye shall see him. But that is based on the presupposition that every eye will see him at the same time. Now, Revelation 1.7 doesn't necessarily say at the same time. It just says that every eye will see him. So I don't know how that's going to work out. You know, is Jesus going to orbit? You know, I don't know. Who, who knows how that's going to happen? But we need not concern ourselves about that. We know that everybody will see him on the globe. Okay? Everybody will see him. Um, so Christ says, if somebody says he's over there, over there, don't believe it. The scripture is clear. There's nothing secret about the second coming of Jesus. And of course, we already read that even the wicked will see him coming. Um, I'm looking at my lesson here because I have to skip over some things. So I have to kind of be uh, judicial here. Um, I've already mentioned the lightning. Jesus uses lightning to, uh, you know, to be a symbol of his second coming. Um, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, what are some of the elements that accompany Jesus' second coming that we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17? Bruce. It's going to be loud. It's going to be loud, the voice of the archangel. Okay. I don't think when Jesus comes back. going to be resurrection. My friends, I am back. It says with a shout, I'm back! A shout! You think you're excited about the second coming? Think of how Jesus feels about it. You think you're anxious to see Jesus coming back? Jesus is more anxious to come back than you are receiving him when he comes back. He is going to shout with the voice of the archangel. In fact, you know, that same voice is going to resurrect the dead. So it's going to be a loud shout. In fact, in Revelation, it describes Jesus' voice as the voice of a what? A multitude or many waters. This is... <sighs> this is a big voice enough to cause <sighs> rumbles going through the planet you know all around you know it'll shake people awake from the dead that's what's going to happen what other elements accompany his second coming according to first thessalonians 4 the trumpet a trumpet i don't know how big this trumpet is maybe it's 50 miles long <laughs> you know, but the trumpet of God, it's in the singular, 
this trumpet, you know, has to be at least a thousand decibels. <laughs> this is one amazing trumpet, you know. Um, this is just, this is music. So it's accompanied with shouting with me. What other, what other thing accompanies the second coming of Christ? What did you say? Resurrection. Resurrection. So if people say, hey, Jesus, is all, I just saw him. You can see him on an ABC dateline, you know, on the BBC. They're showing him on the BBC right now. Don't believe it. Because Jesus' second coming will be accompanied by millions of people coming back to life. Now that is going to be a spectacle. Millions of people coming back to life. This is amazing. Except they won't coming back to life like this. Oh, oh, hi, Jesus. That's not the way it's going to happen. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, read the 50s verses, 51 through 54, 55. In the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be what? Changed. Changed. Now that's an important verse. Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. For this incorruptible must put on, I mean, corruption shall put on incorruption. This perishable shall put on imperishability. That's what he says. Um, I'll just jump ahead of myself. I have a book here entitled, uh, Will You Escape the Tribulation, Rapture Under Attack? It's written by Tim LaHaye uh, a few years ago. And uh, I picked this up some years ago because I wanted to know what uh, he says about the rapture. It's very interesting. Um, and this idea that in the, in the twinkling of an eye we will be changed, what he says in this book is that the rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. Meaning, according to their understanding, this, uh, this rapture that is invisible to the unsaved, obviously, that this rapture, everybody will be resurrected from the dead and those who are alive will be raptured up to heaven, but it will all be invisible and that rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. What does the Bible say will take place in the twinkling of an eye? The change. The change takes place in the twinkling of an eye. Now, Tim LaHaye, um, he strongly, strongly endorses a very literal approach to reading the Scripture. And I'm asking myself, how did you miss that? How did, how did you miss that part? <laughs> you know, it doesn't say the rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. The Scripture says the change from corruption to incorruption, from perishability to imperishability will take place in the twinkling of an eye. It's not like Christ has to uh, you know, oh man, this is going to take me hours to change all of these people, <laughs> you know, to be from corrupt flesh and decayable flesh into a perfect glorified body. It's going to take too long, Father. It's going to take about 500 years. You know, it's, no, it's the changing that takes place that quickly. All right. So, um, and then of course, do the righteous, uh, they meet Jesus where? Where do the righteous meet Jesus at his second coming? In the sky, in the air, to meet with him, to meet with Jesus, he's coming back in the clouds, okay? Again, those elements seem to me, at least, in First Thessalonians, to be very visible, very loud, very glorious. Matthew adds some more detail, that Jesus Christ will come with all of his angels in all of his glory, and if you read Revelation, it says in Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, by the brightness of Jesus' coming, the lawless one will be destroyed, along with all of his followers, which seems to be the indication. So this is going to be bright and glorious, brighter than the noonday sun shining in its strength, the Bible says. These things accompany the second coming. All right, well, let me talk a little bit about the rapture. Here's the interesting thing about uh, the popular understanding of the rapture. I'm reading from this book, so it's not like I'm second-guessing what 
evangelical Christians are saying. I'm just, I like to do that. If you want to know what somebody believes, then read what they say. It helps to read what we say about what they say. But the important thing to do is go to the source. In fact, that's a good, that's a good advice as far as relationships and things that are being said. Go to the source. Don't rely on hearsay. Go to the source. Because you'll always hear hearsay from somebody else and they always have their twist on things. It's the same thing here. Go to the source. So I'm going to the source. This is what he says. He says, it's entitled, The Order of Rapture Translation Events. By combining these three passages and studying them carefully, we can outline the sequence of events in the rapture. They are totally different from the coming of Christ to this earth in power and great glory. So here's what evangelical world says. The second coming of Jesus and the rapture which was supposed to take place in 2012, in May and then in October. <laughs> Remember that? Yes. Remember, um, oh, what's his name? Camping. Harold Camping. I was going to say Hanegraaff. Harold Camping in 2012. Do you remember that? Um, you can still see this stuff on YouTube. You know, this, this poor gentleman, very sincere and humble man, is in Times uh, Square, New York. And he's got a bunch of hecklers around. He's just surrounded. And even there's cameras there. And, and it, the countdown is happening, you know, to the date of the rapture. And this poor man with his brochures and everything, I actually admire this man. He has his brochures and he spent thousands, I think he sold his house, to help promote the secret rapture. Uh, and uh, he's there and everybody, five, four, three, two, one, right in the middle of the street in Times Square. And he goes, hey, it didn't happen, hey. And he's this poor guy. He's alone in a sea of mockers. I don't understand. It was, uh, everything points to the Bible that this is supposed to happen now. Um, I don't understand. You know, poor guy, poor guy. Makes me, remi reminds me of those on October 22, 1844. Reminds me of them. And then there's an interview afterwards. He says, you know, according to all the calculations, this is correct. He says, but I haven't lost my faith. Christ, you know, we will be raptured, etc." He lost all of his money. Um, but so I'm telling you, the belief of evangelical world, the second coming of Christ and the rapture are separate events separated by seven years of tribulation. Okay. Now, this is what he says. Here is the evidence for the secret rapture. Number one, number one, the Lord himself, well, let me say this. Note, in the rapture, uh, okay, well, it says here, the order of rapture translation events. And he has 13, he has 13, he has actually 15 points here. So quite convincing if you read this stuff. Number one. The Lord himself will descend from his father's house where he is preparing a place for us. John, what? 14, verses 1 through 3. And he says this. What does this say, Bruce? What does this say? John 14, and what text is that? 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Hmm. He uses 1 Thessalonians 4.16 to describe this secret rapture. Now, if you are a literalist, and you strongly believe the Old Testament promises have to be fulfilled to literal national Israel, and we have to take things literally, then if this is a secret rapture, where is the literal trump of God? Where is the literal voice of the archangel Michael? Where is the literal resurrecting from the dead? Where is the literal every eye shall see him? And where is the literal all the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of him? Where is that? Don't you see some inconsistency here? So the rapturists use this verse when Paul is talking about the hope of the second coming and all the things that accompany it, he's using it for the secret rapture. Okay, so let's go on. Oh dear, I wish I had two more hours. Would you like to stay here two more hours? No, I know you don't. <laughs> I, know, I know you don't. Um, I'm going to have to pick and choose here. Uh, silence. 
Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to have to cut this off. Um, I may just continue some of this in this afternoon. I may or may not, depending on what you want me to do. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to notice this. Verses 2 and 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Whoops. Verses 2 and 3. This is what Paul says. I'll start with verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he's saying, don't worry yourselves. I'm just, I'm correcting the information. Let's, let's clear the air here. This is how it's going to happen. And he says, verse 3, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, which day? The day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, second coming. For that day will not come unless, what? Unless the what? The falling away. My version, this version I'm using today, the ESV says, unless the rebellion comes first and the man of what? Sin, Sin or lawlessness, many uh, translations say lawlessness, is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Now, this man of lawlessness will be revealed before the second coming of Christ. Okay? By the way, um, I need to go... Well, for this, what Paul is saying is this second coming of this man of lawlessness, this, second, this false coming, the parousia, this false coming, and he will be revealed before Jesus Christ comes back. So things are going to get worse before they get better, okay? And the second coming of Christ, uh, our understanding of Scripture, what Scripture says, is the second coming of Christ, that's the only chance you have. It's the only chance you have. Once Christ comes back, that's it. There is no chances. The rapture theory states that there is a secret rapture of the church only Christians, only Christians, they go to heaven and then those who are left, the unsaved, are left. And the Jews will now be converted. And they will have their temple back in Palestine and they will reinstitute the animal sacrifices. When that takes place, the Antichrist comes in the middle of that seven-year tribulation, and then all of a sudden, the Jews will start evangelizing the world. People will be converted. And then Christ comes back, and guess what? People will be able to go to heaven. Those Jews that were converted, and those people that were converted by the Jews. And the ones that they left. So, what this means is, once Christians are out of the way, there is still a chance for you to be saved. If you're not saved when the rapture takes place, you still have a chance. By the Jews who will evangelize you. This is their scenario. I don't see anything that even comes close to what the Bible is teaching that. Now, I'm going to end it with this note. This whole idea of the rapture is completely, I wouldn't say completely, but the main foundation, the main foundation of this, you have to go back to the book of Daniel. And you have to go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. This is the foundation of the secret rapture. Because in Daniel 9, it talks about a prophecy of 490 years, right? Right? Of those 490 years, it's sectioned off in threes. The angel tells uh, Daniel 
There will be seven weeks. I'll go this way. There will be seven weeks, which is 49 years. Then there will be 62 weeks, which is whatever that is, in years, because a day equals a year. And then there will be one week, which is another seven years. So you have seven years, you have one week, you have seven weeks, excuse me, you have 62 weeks, and you have one week. It's sectioned off. Okay? So this is, what, this is where the foundation of the rapture comes from. That last week, you have seven weeks, 62 weeks, which equals 69. Then you have one week left. What they do is they'll take that one week and they'll put it in a slingshot or catapult and they'll stretch it back as hard as they can. I mean, you have to really stretch it back hard because the farther you stretch back, the farther it'll go into the future. And they let go. And this last week, this last seven years, is so far into the future that as I speak, it is still in the future. Well, here's the problem with this. Here's the big problem with this. What about the first 69 weeks? Is that a literal 69 weeks? Or is it a prophetic 483 years? 483 years. It's 483 years. Those who interpret the Bible on a very literal basis and believe in futurism, what do, how do they interpret those first 69 weeks? As literal or as symbolic of years? It's interesting. As symbolic of years. That's how they get the final seven years. So what are they using? What type of school of interpretation are using? Futurism or historicism? Futurism. Historicism. They're using both. Because historicism says a day equals a year. Not literal. So they're using historicism because they know all of the events portrayed in Daniel 9, there's no way it can take place in a literal 70 weeks. There's, it's impossible. So we have to use the day for year principle, which is what historicists use. But if you're going to take that last seven years, that last seven week, that last week, and fling it far into the future, so now you have a big gap, let me ask this question. Where's the gap between the first seven weeks and the next 62 weeks? Where's the gap there? There is no gap. So my question is, where do you get the principle of separating this one and fling it into the future, but you don't have a gap between the first set of seven weeks and the second set of 62 weeks. Why isn't there a gap there? Where is the biblical evidence for flinging this into the future and not separating this? There's very, very strong inconsistencies here. That's where the rapture is built. That's the foundation. I just described it to you. Because that last week... At the beginning of the week is where the rapture takes place. And so the philosophy, the theory is, well, the reason why it's flung into the future is because of a literal, very literal interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel. God is not done with Israel yet. So these prophecies about returning their land and reinstituting the temple sacrifices, it still has to happen. But somehow the church came into being, the apostles started the church, and that's just like a hiccup in God's final purposes for Israel. It's like a big parenthesis, which we are in right now. So the church has to be raptured. It's got to get out of the way. It's got to go up to heaven, get out of the way. Now God can deal again with the Israelites. And here's the other problem I have with this. Where in Scripture does it state that animal sacrifices need to be reinstituted? Where in New Testament Scripture and in Revelation does it say the temple needs to be literally and earthly restored again in animal sacrifices? What does that do with Jesus on the cross? You tell me. It completely invalidates the sacrifice of Jesus and what his blood accomplished for us completely takes it out of the picture because the animal sacrifices need to be reinstituted again because the Old Testament prophecies have to be literal and take place for the literal Jews in the last days. Completely invalidates what Jesus did on the cross for us. 
So, with that, why don't we sing? <laughs>